principles for H spheres in homogeneous three manifolds. Right. <laughs> so uh, this is somewhat of an introductory talk about uh, interesting problems and what we understand about the solutions to those problems. In a sense, they're very basic question, questions. So the, uh, the class of manifolds which are sort of most interesting to geometers in dimension three are uh, homogeneous three manifolds. So that's where the asymmetry group acts transitively on the manifold. So the geometry is essentially locally, the geometry is the same everywhere, at least locally, it makes sense. And uh, what are eight spheres? Uh, it's just a short abbreviation for saying uh, I have a sphere, so a topological sphere, whose mean curvature is a value h, okay? And I'm always going to assume by orienting the surface appropriately, that number h is bigger and equal to zero. Right, you change the orientation, you change the, the mean curvature. Okay? So I'm looking for spheres which have constant mean curvature, a number bigger and equal to zero. Okay, um, okay so that's, that's the, the setup. Uh, a, lot of this is motiv a lot of this work and these conjectures are motivated by what happens in R3 with the flat metric, and everyone understands what constant mean curvature spheres are in that case. They're just spheres of radius r, say, after translation, centered at the origin. So we understand so sort of completely uh, the, what's going on in R3. We understand some things in other three manifolds, other homogeneous three manifolds. OK, so uh, first, for just people who aren't real familiar with the subject, um, what, uh, what are homogeneous three manifolds? Well, it turns out most homogeneous three manifolds are Lie groups equipped with a left invariant metric. So under left translation, uh, the group acts on itself by left translation. You want that to be an isometry. So basically, you take a, an inner product of the identity element. You translate by left translation. That produces an inner product at all the tangent spaces in the space. And you declare that's your metric. Okay? And then left translation will be automatically be an isometry. So in general, you could say, well, how, how big a dimensional family of metrics do I have? If you take the metric on R3, take the Lie group R3, it's commutative. There's only one metric that's left invariant. That's the flat metric. But as you go to other spaces, uh, the dimension of these left invariant metrics increases and increases up to dimension three. So you can kind of view the space of all these uh, metrically groups. And these, these are special examples which aren't metrically groups, product of sphere with uh, uh, R, those are also, you have spheres of constant mean curvature, those are also examples of homogeneous three manifolds, but those are not Lie groups, okay? So those are, that's sort of a one parameter family of sort of examples which are not Lie groups, whereas the, 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 the moduli space of all these uh, Lie group uh, homogeneous three manifolds, they form a three dimensional family. And I, again, for the purpose of looking at two spheres, I may as well restrict to the case where I'm simply connected. Because the two spheres are simply connected, I can lift to the universal cover. So it's very natural to only look at the case where this, the uh, three manifold is simply connected if I'm restricting the case of two spheres. If I understand their geometry, I might as well do that. So we have these topological types for the manifolds we're talking about. So this is homogeneous, not a Lie group. After scaling the metric, I can just think of this as a sphere of radius 1. In, in general, I have lots of different uh, Lie group structures in R3. In S3, I have one Lie group structure, which is SU2. So you think of the three spheres being the unit length quaternions. Okay? So you got one Lie group here, no Lie group here, lots of Lie groups here. Three-dimensional family of Lie groups here. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, one, yeah, uh, no, sorry, how many family? One, two, I'd say, I guess one, param one parameter family here of different groups, but lots of metrics, three-dimensional families of metrics. Okay. So uh, you could say, well, what, what kind of conjectures could I be talking about? And as I said before, you want to try to generalize what happened, what you know about in R3. So in R3, for example, constant mean curvature spheres are round spheres. So, for example, you could ask the question about being embedded. Okay, that's a general question you could ask. And in this case, so you want, 
In S2 cross R, it turns out you can actually classify all the constantly curvature spheres. And yes, they're all embedded by classification. In SU2, uh, this is, remember this is, corresponds to the lead group SU2 with a left invariant mat metric. It depends on the metric. So for lots of metrics, every constant mean curvature sphere is embedded. But for lots of other metrics, it's not true. There are non-embedded uh, constant mean curvature spheres. It just depends. The standard round metric, then it's easy to understand what, what, what the spheres are. They're just intersections with hyperplanes, like, like circles on a sphere. Those are, and they're certainly all embedded. <clears throat> OK, so that's kind of one question you can ask. Um, let's see. You could ask uh, properties about stability. So you could, for example, say index 1. So in R3, all the spheres uh, have index 1 with respect to the stability operator. OK? It means one negative eigenvalue for the stability operator. Here, essentially, the answer is yes, except on S2 cross a point, that's a minimal two-sphere, and that's stable. So here we also have index zero. But besides this one special case, the answer is yes, as long as you are a totally geodesic two-sphere. You are going to have index one. Uh, apparently, now here's where you start getting into, uh, apparently the answer is yes here as well. And uh, so one thing is I'm going to prove is, uh, in my talk, is yes for SU2. So if you take a left invariant metric on SU2, then uh, every sphere has uh, index 1. And you can think of lots of other questions. You can say, well, how are the spheres parameterized? What's the moduli space of them? So in R3, the moduli space of non-congruent spheres are just spheres centered at the origin of a given radius, and they have related constant mean curvature, one over that radius. So as the radius gets bigger, the mean curvature gets smaller. And it's a, sort of a linear, inversely linear way. <clears throat> and uh, in particular, uh, the sphere is determined by its mean curvature, right? because we have 1 over h is the radius of the sphere. So you could ask, is the moduli space of spheres in these spaces have a similar property? Is it a one parameter family of spheres parameterized, for example, by the mean curvature? Or, for example, parameterized by a ball that they bound? Suppose you knew that they were embedded. If they were embedded, then, except in this very special case, anyway, they usually bound a ball, right? embedded spheres, bound balls in these spaces. You could look at the ball and look at the volume. Maybe they're parameterized by the volume of the ball they bound. So there are lots and lots and lots of questions you could ask. And uh, I'll just kind of leave those uh, right there. So, so let me start really kind of at the beginning. What are, what are uh, minimal constant mean curvature surfaces? What kind of behavior do they have? Of course, in R3, we have catenoid, helicoid. And having zero mean curvature just means that you're a critical point with uh, variations of area, uh, compactly supported variations of area. So if you take a compact part of the surface, you fix the boundary and start doing a variation, you look at how the area changes during that smooth deformation, and you want to have it be a critical point of area. If you go to constant mean curvature, you have a similar property, like we have spheres, cylinders, and for example, Delaunay surface, lots of, lots of examples. There, you need to restrict the variations, your critical point again, to compactly supported variations. But you need to have the variations preserve volume. That means the function on the average is zero. The, think, of, think of the variational vector field as given by f times the unit normal. You need the average value of f to be zero. So you're pushing volume on one side just as much as you're going up as, as much as you're going on the other side. So volume has a plus and negative sign to it. So if you use those kinds of variations with respect to functions whose average value is zero, then you find out that's equivalent to having constant mean curvature. OK. If you're minimal, you don't have to make that assumption. All right, so simple examples. Of course, we have soap film surfaces. 
uh, surfaces that minimize surface tension, minimize energy. Minimizing energy means the coordinate functions minimize energy. Minimizing energy means they're harmonic functions locally. So, so we have uh, soap films or physical realizations of, of minimal surfaces. And uh, the volume constraint property can also be viewed as a pressure differential property. Uh, so you want to have the surface, uh, if you make a soap bubble, it's physically stable. But imagine taking this wire and having a pressure difference, a difference in pressure on each side of the soap film. Where it's, where it's higher pressure, it's going to push, a, push the soap film up, away from that. And you'll again get this nice property that locally you uh, are a surface of least energy with the property of a constant pressure difference. Okay? And that as, as you change that pr pressure difference, you change the mean curvature, the constant mean curvature. So the, all these things are very physical, and that gives you a lot of intuition about the shapes and what should happen. It doesn't tell you what happens, but at least you can start trying to reason physically when you're trying to understand local structures of these surfaces. Okay, so now I'm going to get to the main perspective. What are, what are these problems that we wanted to generalize? What are these interesting conjectures about spheres and homogeneous three manifolds? And I've, as I said before, S2 cross R, we understand everything completely. So I'm going to focus my attention on metric Lie groups. So I'm a three-dimensional Lie group. It's either topologically R3 or it's the group SU2, and I have a left invariant metric on it. Otherwise, I'm in the S2 cross R, and I understand everything about, let's suppose I understand everything about H spheres in that case by classification. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to be looking at what happens first in R3. What do we know about sort of these conjectures in R3? So I'm going to be looking first at a closed uh, surface in R3. So that means a compact with no boundary. Okay. So certainly we can't be minimal because the coordinate functions of a minimal surface are harmonic, and you've got to be constant on any compact surface. So you're not going to be able to have a minimal surface, but we know we have spheres. And uh, they have constant mean curvature, and they're compact. So uh, we have this famous result of Hoff that if your gene is zero, then a necessary and sufficient condition to have constant mean curvature is it's a round sphere. So we understand exactly what they are. And we understand the moduli space as well. It's one over the radius of the sphere, where the mean curvature parameterizes the moduli space of all examples. We also know that uh, if you have an embedded compact uh, constant mean curvature surface in R3, uh, you can apply the Alexander reflection principle, and you can prove that the um, surface has all the symmetry of the space. That means it's completely revolution, is complete in every sense it's a surface of revolution. Well, it means it's a round sphere. Okay, so you can prove that if you're embedded and have finite genus, um, I mean, then you're in fact a round sphere. You have genus zero. You can't have a torus. You can't have a soap film that's an embedded torus in space. So let me just sort of add one related question here. That theorem of Alexander is actually true for what's called Alexandrov embedded. And so let me just say what that means. This is a loosening of the property of being embedded. So the surface can self-intersect but I still want it to bound an immersed ball in space. So here's, for example, here's a, you can imagine this being like a two-sphere in some space, right? And if you look on this side of the surface, on the mean convex side, I can see an immersed ball. So if I can put it, if the sphere bounds an immersed ball, or submersed ball, it's immersion, in, it's, we're talking about a three-dimensional ball, uh, then I'll call the surface Alexandrov embedded. So in fact, Alexandrov proved if you're Alexandrov embedded, you're also a round sphere. You don't actually have to be embedded. You can loosen the hypothesis of being embedded, and you still get round spheres. So what do we know about this? Uh, basically, well, the totally geodesic two-sphere is an exception here, but the answer is yes, except for a slice. Um, again, Probably yes. And one thing I'm going to check is in SU2, the answer is again yes. So 
um, all the two spheres, even though they are not embedded, right? In general, they're still all Alexandrov embedded. And I'll be very clear from the, the, the proof of understanding what the moduli space is. Right? The forming, okay, I'll talk about that when it comes up. Okay. And then we have this very pretty result of uh, De Carmo and uh, Barbosa, uh, where they uh, said, well, suppose I have a constant mean curvature surface that solves the isoparametric problem. Suppose it minimizes uh, surface, uh, surface area for bounding a given volume. Well, those are round spheres, we know that. But suppose I'm just sort of physically stable. I'm sort of physically a local minimum for area with respect to volume-preserving deformations. So a potential solution to the isoparametric problem, if you have that weak stability property, in other words, stable local minimum with respect to volume-preserving deformations, then it's very easy to say you're always of index one, okay? So stable implies index one. Index one does not always imply stable. So in S2 cross R, there are Everything, say, has index one, okay? But not all of them are stable. But we should be, we should be, um, we, okay, index one, but not stable. But here, say here, we should, still should be stable. Again, things fail here. You have index one, but in general, you don't have stability. The weak stability, remember, weak stability implies index one. So. So, uh, so anyway, if, if you look at their proof where they studied the stability, the same proof shows index one suffices, and they prove this thing in n dimensions. It's sort of a very nice question: What is the index of? What's the index of a compact uh, eight surface in uh, R n hypersurface? Okay. So the first kind of one of the most basic questions you ask in mathematics is uniqueness. And then, like I say, you can ask it in, in different ways. You can, is, it, is there a unique sphere bounding a given volume ball? All these different kinds of questions. A very natural question is the space of spheres parameterized by the mean curvature values. Or in particular, if I take two spheres which have the same mean curvature value, are they congruent in space? We understand that's true in R3, right? Same concept means that this sphere has radius, this round sphere of radius R, this one's a round sphere of radius r, and I can translate one sphere to the other sphere. So this is a very general, can, one of the most basic kind of questions, and uh, it's not a conjecture of Hoff, but it's, at least people I know that generally refer to this as the Hoff uniqueness question or conjecture or problem. He didn't actually himself conjecture it, okay? But it's, it's a, sort of very natural. He proved uniqueness of spheres in certain spaces, and we would like to generalize what he did. So in that sense, it's a, usually called a Hoff uniqueness conjecture. Okay, so where do we know this is true? Well, we know certainly in R3, but in, in general, if you have constant curvature, you also know it's true. So constant curvature is when the, you have a six-dimensional symmetry group. Remember, we're always restricting, simply on the universal cover of these problems. So we're talking about these, say, these two spaces. Okay, let's kind of forget this mostly for the moment. We're looking at these two spaces. And like I said, uh, the con this conjecture is true for S2 cross R, and that follows from the next statement here. If the symmetry group is four-dimensional, then one has, again, the proof, a, proof, a way of proving this conjecture. So how does one do it? One, uh, from this a generalization of the Hoff quadratic differential, one can prove that there's a one-parameter group of isometries, a four-dimensional group, you have a three-dimensional space, so that means you have rotations around axes. Okay, so, so uh, that, what that ends up meaning is you, you, you prove that the sphere is a surface of, a sphere of revolution. That reduces constructing such spheres to an ODE, and you can solve those ODE questions and, and just write down all the solutions and by just looking at them, you can check that they have different mean curvatures. So it's more like just this, you can prove some property. That property allows you to classify. By classification, you can verify that the conjecture is true. Okay, there. Okay, everyone get that? Okay.
is a one parameter family of solutions, and you watch how the mean curvature varies. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the main part of my talk. I need a little language. Uh, we're going to talk about the general conjectures. And I'm restricting now to metric league groups. Like I said, we don't need S2 cross R. We understand things in S2 cross R. So to understand these spheres, we really only have to restrict to metric league groups. That means a league three, means R3 or SU2 means one of these two spaces. You're, you're we're going to the universal cover. You have a simply connected group and with a left invariant metric. Okay? And we're calling those spaces, they're Ramani manifolds, we're calling those metrically groups. So it's an underlying group structure and a underlying metric, Ramani metric. I should say, in general, you can have two isomorphically groups, non-isomorphically groups, with isometric metrics. Okay, so you can take a leak, this lead group with a less invariant metric. You can take a non-isomorphic lead group with a less invariant metric. And the spaces of Ramani manifolds can be isometric. So there's a little, there's a little, little different. Uh, you don't one has. It, I'm not saying it's unique. It, it has the structure of a lead group with a left invariant metric. Okay, that's all I'm saying. I'm not say, all right. So it's kind of two things together. It's a group structure together with a left invariant metric. Okay, so here we get this fundamental number. This is the just a, an amazing number. It's, uh, it's related to lots of very important uh, functional properties of the space, not just about spheres, uh, custom and curvature spheres. So it, it sort of comes up when you want to think of the solving isoparametric problems. Um, so what's the, we're doing in FEMA of a bunch of numbers, what are the number, where do the numbers come from? I look at all immersed, compact immersed, oh, compact means here closed, closed I have all closed uh, immersed surfaces in the space. For each of these surfaces, it has a mean curvature function, or at least its absolute values. I, have, I can think of the absolute value of that mean curvature function. So I can think of the mean curvature as being e bigger than or equal to zero at every point. Uh, I can take the maximum of that function. I get a number. And then I take the infimum over all of these numbers. And that's called H of X. And since it's so special, we have a special name for it. Okay. So this number is called the critical mean curvature of that space. And it's fundamental. It's really, when you want to study the geometry of these spaces, it's just a fundamental question. And lots and lots of conjectures are related. To this number is equivalent. It can be defined a lot of different ways. So this is one way to define this number. There are other, there are other ways to define it. And you can show that this way of defining it sometimes is the same as this way. And then you have conjectures that say you always have the same, same thing. So I'm going to kind of look at a case where we can calculate this. So, for example, take any metric on S3. Suppose you're in the SU2 case, like this case. You, you can always, Leon Simons proved that there's always an embedded minimal two-sphere. Okay. In general, if you take, as Harold pointed out to me, in general, take any compact three manifold, there's always a compact minimal surface in it, embedded, in fact. So certainly, h of x is zero if you're compact. So for the three sphere, this number is always zero, because there exists compact minimal surfaces in it. OK, so we understand how to calculate this in this space. We understand it's always zero. All right. Now here's a really fascinating, uh, one of these fascinating results that relates uh, this number to a famous uh, invariant of the space called the Cheeger constant. So uh, we're looking at non-compact now. So we're, we're looking at the R3 case now. So we're non-compact R3 with a homogeneous metric, it's a leak group, a left, uh, metric leak group. So inside this, the, inside this space, I look at all, say, smooth uh, bounded domains. Uh, here we are, some kind of smooth bounded domain K. OK, it has a boundary, which is the boundary surface. I look at the area of the boundary of that domain. I divide by the volume of that domain. I get a number. Now I want to try to minimize that number over all smooth domains. Okay, and I get a number. Okay, and it's called the Cheeger constant. 
If you are not, okay, so we're, we're not looking at SU2, that's this case. Uh, we're looking at, S, at R3. If the Lie group is not that special Lie group, remember there's a one parameter family of Lie groups. If we aren't that particular Lie group, then this H of X number we calculate, one half of it is the Cheeger constant of space. So this, this is not too hard to prove. Um, Okay, uh, I conjecture it's also true in PSL2R. I just don't know how to do it. I've been working on this. I, I kind of got involved in this subject about a year ago and more involved last summer. So one of the, one of the things I can figure out, it's not hard, too hard to prove this, but I still don't know how to prove it in PSL2R, and I'd really like to do that. I'd really like to know how to calculate the Cheever constant for PSL2R with a left invariant metric. Of course, as that left invariant metric changes, the constant's going to change, right? Right. For example, just scaling the metric makes it change. All right, makes it drop. <clears throat> okay. Now, for hyperbolic three space, it's certainly easy to see what this number is. It's just one. You use that formula. Hyperbolic three space is a lead group with a left invariant metric. It's not PSL2R. It's a non-unimodular group. Uh, so uh, you can calculate the number by that and you can calculate that so you can figure out H, H of hyperbolic free space is certainly one. There are lots of ways to see that. Okay, so that, that's also an example where we're familiar with what that number is. And for example, you could use this formula if you wanted to do it. Okay, so what are the conjectures? So we saw some, uh, <coughs> let me just go back one, one time here. So we have uh, this H of X number, somehow that's going to play a very special role in these conjectures. Let's just see what we have. So we're trying to, one of the basic questions is, what is the moduli space of all uh, two spheres? Of course, we don't care where they are. So we're really up to congruence. That's our, our natural thing to look at. Like in R3, the net, one parameter family of, t of spheres, two spheres, constant curvature. So the claim is somehow that we have the same property as in the standard metric. What happens in the standard metric? You start with a little teeny round sphere with almost infinite positive mean curvature, and then you just go to zero. So in R3, R3 is a unimodular group, and it's not PSL2R, so that this number is always zero. So, right? And we agree this is zero? Right? There are spheres with arbitrarily small positive mean curvature, right? So you take the mean theme of all, all those numbers, you're certainly going to get zero. And certainly, the, this interval parameterizes all of the spheres in R3. However, this number in PSL2R with some metrics, for example, is not, um, this is never zero, okay? No matter what metric you put on it. So there, we, we're not going to start at zero. The spheres ha don't go down to become almost minimal, like you do in R3. Like, huge sphere is almost a plane, right? We don't have that property. Okay, so this is the conjecture, that we have this magic number. The moduli space is an open interval, and it's parameterized by the mean curvature values. And somehow it's a, it should be a nice, like, analytic space, like a one, it, analytic intervals in a natural sense. So it's a natural, natural parameterization. Now, if we're not topologically R3, then this uh, second part, so suppose you're not R3, that means you're S3, then uh, in fact, then you go all the way down to zero. Remember, remember for S3, well, uh, SU2, anyway, SU2 with any, any metric on here, so we had topological S3, remember this was zero. So we're going from there to infinity, right? We, in particular, the uni is a uniqueness property. So for each mean curvature, and SU if you take SU2 with a left invariant metric, for each value, a possible value of mean curvature, there's a unique sphere. In particular, there's a unique minimal sphere. In particular, all minimal spheres are embedded. I mean, there's just trivial things you can, you can think are consequences of this. Um, okay, so that's, uh, we're gonna see why that's true in a minute. Um, Okay, so let's see, how am I doing with time? Oh, I got lots of time. Okay. Um, 
All right, so this next conjecture is related to this table I put. Remember, Alexander from Embedded, yes. So we're going to see yes here. We, have, we weren't really considering this case. The conjecture would be yes here as, as well. So if you have a one-parameter family of spheres, and you start out being Alexander from Embedded, during the deformation, the ball just keeps moving, and you can see pretty easily using mean or maximum principle that those, those, those three manifolds always stay three manifolds. They never cross through themselves in the wrong way. So that ball just sort of moves as the sphere moves. So this is very closely related to, to proving number one. If you can prove number one, number the property of being Alexander alphabet that just immediately follows. So here we come back to this very interesting property for, for constant mean curvature spheres in R3. Barbosa and Dekarma proved um, index one means you're a sphere, right? And, and all spheres we understand also have index one. They're all weakly stable, for example. So uh, this is saying the same thing happens in metrically groups. Okay, so every H sphere in any metrically group is Alexander from Embedded, has index one and nullity three. You can also see in R3, round spheres have nullity three. There are three independent Jacobi functions uh, on, the, on the sphere, which come from translational killing fields in the space. So we uh, understand this is true in R3, claim this is true in general. <coughs> okay, now here we come to that embeddedness question over here. Remember, we didn't say what happens here, anyway. And we're saying, yes, things work here. We can't do anything here because it's not true. It's not true in Bourget spheres, even. We have a four-dimensional ensemble group. Harold's spheres of evolution are not always embedded. So we can't prove embedded. But if we're R3, there's no obstruction there. Somehow, what happens in S3 doesn't keep you from proving yes here. And I'd say almost certainly the answer is yes. So we'd like to know that. OK. All right. So uh, Hoff, we've been talking about Hoff a lot. If you take the Bielingly group uh, R3, we understand uh, everything here. Now, there's an interesting, this is just a sort of a comment and what I'm going to talk about later. There are certain cases where it can prove Hoff uniqueness. That means two spheres, two different spheres with the same constant mean curvature, then in fact, they differ by a left translation if they have the same mean curvature if one of the spheres has index one. So if I can prove I have an index one sphere for a given value of constant mean curvature, then we know how to prove it's the only sphere. So to understand this problem, you can see you want to focus your attention on index one spheres and prove that for all possible values of mean curvature, there exists a sphere of constant mean curvature, that value, and has index one. Then you solve the uniqueness question. So just think about that for a minute. So, so I want you to see how the family of index one spheres moves the values of mean curvature I get. If I can prove all the mean curvature values I obtain with index one spheres are all the values I ever obtain, then I've proved Hopf uniqueness by this result. Because index existence of an index one sphere guarantees uniqueness for that value of the mean curvature. Okay. Right. In particular, uh, this result applies if you have, have an index one sphere inherits all the symmetries of the space. So if you have a four-dimensional symmetry group, you get an independent proof the sphere is a sphere of revolution. You don't have to apply uh, the result that uh, Abrish and Harold, they prove, got a, a, a quadratic differential, they show vanishing means it's a surface of revolution. If it's a surface of revolution, you can classify them. This, if your index one sphere, the first statement, so the, the, the dot right above the last one, implies that it's unique up to left translation. So all those additional symmetries are symmetries of the surface. Okay. All right. So it sort of gives you a very general way of how things are round. Things are being forced to become roundish, as symmetric as the space they live in. Okay, so let's go through a very uh, educational uh, sort of exercise in trying to understand these conjectures. We believe we can prove 
uh, maybe I should say, we, we believe we can prove all of these properties except for number three. Yeah, we can prove it in number three in certain very interesting cases, but uh, we believe we can prove these other properties. Um, so in SU3, we don't have to worry about that last property about being embedded because it's not true. So the conjecture doesn't say anything about S3. The spheres aren't always embedded. So we want to prove that conjecture in the case of topologically being S3. So uh, this is just sort of a restatement of it. Uh, it says, so I suppose I'm topologically S3. That means I'm, the Lie group structure is SU2, and I have a left invariant metric. Then the claim is for each number bigger than or equal to zero, there's a unique H-sphere. Furthermore, they are all Alexandrov embedded. They all have index one, nullity three. And the areas, this is an inter another interesting part that comes out of the understanding the moduli space, the, the areas always form a, a, an interval. Uh, of course, every sphere is positive area, right? So you don't ever get zero. But you have a maximal area sphere. Of constant mean curvature. These numbers, the A of R is a continuous function on the other space, and you understand the asymptotics. When the mean curvature is very, very big, you're almost a little round sphere. And a little round sphere has very small area. So you understand what happens at plus infinity, and you want to understand uh, what happens as you, as you get near zero, minimal. Okay, so, uh, so how does this proof work? The proof is very so it's very easy to follow the steps. Unfortunately, there are like seven steps. But each step makes sense and it's sort of easy to, at least easy to understand, or understand what's going on in that step. OK, so um, we understand that x is SU2 with a left invariant metric. So it's a metrically group, which is SU2 as a group. And uh, as I said before, we want to focus on index one spheres because of this nice result about there's a unique one for each. If you have an index one sphere, it's unique. It's the only constant mean curvature sphere with that value. So we're going to focus our attention on that. Notice that the, the theorem is saying that every sphere is index one, right? So, so this is a very natural thing to do. We want to focus our attention on the ones which have index one. So if you see that, that sort of purple, the, no, blue sigma, that's a sphere of index, a constant mean curvature sphere of index uh, uh, one, okay, with some value of mean curvature, okay. So the first observation is that this sphere always has nullity three, and uh, so what you have with respect to the stability operators, you have a Laplacian plus a potential on the sphere, and Chang's theorem says that, okay, remember we have index one, so we have one negative eigenvalue. Look at the first, the second eigenfunction. Its multiplicity can't be bigger than three. Okay, so, the, or at least, at least when, maybe we should say, say something else about the, um, well, how do we get nullity on this sphere? Uh, one way to get nullity is from a killing field in the ambient space. You take a killing field, and you take inner product of that with the unit normal. That gives you a Jacobi function on the, on the surface. In a Lie group, you always have uh, a three-dimensional family of right invariant vector fields. And right invariant vector fields are always killing. Okay? Now, if you can't, uh, so if you have a, some surface in here, we have the killing fields, right? The right, say, right invariant. I don't know what that now. Anyway. K, they have all the right invariant uh, killing fields. Each one of those induces a Jacobi function on the sphere. Okay? So there's a map from this linear space to the space of Jacobi functions, right? And of course, you have the zero, uh, the, but there's nothing in the kernel of that map. Why? Because to be in the kernel of the map, that means that, that, that the vector field is tangent everywhere to the sphere. But right invariant vector field is never zero, and there are no non zero vector fields on the sphere. So, you have an, if you're on a sphere, this is always injective. This goes injectively into the sphere. So if you produce a three-dimensional family of killing fields of Jacobi functions, and you're not allowed to have more than those. And I should say that all of these Jacobi functions you produce have the property that their, their integral equals zero. 
And that just follows by the divergence theorem. The average value of the Jacobi functions, of a Jacobi function, one of these Jacobi functions is zero because it comes from a killing field. And you apply the divergence theorem. The divergence of a killing field is zero. You can just think, look on the ball that you surround. You have to, this much flux going out as you're going in. But that flux comes from J in a product the unit normal. Okay. Okay, so now we're in a good shape to try to understand that there's a manifold structure on the space of these um, non-congruent. So M of, M of X, calligraphic M of X, is the space of all the index one spheres. And we can, up to congruence. And we want to see that that's a one manifold, and like one manifold locally parameterized by uh, the mean curvature values. So uh, basically, you want to try to solve the following equation. You have the stability operator. You want to apply it to a function. And you want to get the number one. So you want to, as you move in a var this variation, you want the derivative of the mean curvature to just be increasing at a constant rate. That's the property of moving through a family of constant mean curvature surfaces where, um, where the, uh, you just, uh, I say that, right, you're just going through a family of one, of, if you move through a family of constant mean curvature surfaces and the constant mean curvature is varying, then the variational function satisfies this equation. And it, well, it turns out that, uh, remember, okay, so this is something I have, I, I, I haven't thought about this a lot recently, and Harold just pointed out that it's very easy to uh, understand why you can s find a G in this case. So we're on, we're on the three sphere. We have the null of is three. We're in index one. Null of is three. And uh, the, uh, okay, so the, uh, so we're trying to find a G that's orthogonal to the, how do you say, orthogonal to the, co-kernel of the image of the L map, right? But all the Jacobi functions are uh, average value zero. So if you put one times them, you also want to get, get zero. So there is a G that's in the, that's a, that's a, that's in the image of L, okay? And then you have to go through and try to apply the implicit function theorem. Verify you can go through and do that. Okay. Okay, so... We see that we have this sort of local one-manifold property. Um, a very crucial result you have about uh, index one spheres is that you look at the left invariant Gauss map. So it's just like the usual Gauss map. You have uh, a normal vector at the point P. You have the identity element over here. I left translation by uh, P inverse takes this point over to here, and that gives me a unit vector. If this is unit normal here, it gives me a unit vector on the sphere at the identity element in the tangent. So this is S2 inside of the uh, tangent space at the identity element uh, in the space. That's called the left invariant Gauss map. So we want to see that if you have an index one sphere, then the Gauss map is always a diffeomorphism. But since it's a two-sphere, going to a two-sphere, it suffices by covering space theory to prove that the differential is always non-degenerate. There's nothing in the kernel of the differential, then it's a diffeomorphism because everything's simply connected. So the, the prob property is, um, so if, if you have something that's in the kernel, so something like this, if this vec vector VP is in the kernel, then it turns out that you can, you can um, so the surface is sort of trying to be invariant in this direction by sort of one, a killing field that, that goes in the same direction as V. So you go through and check that if you look at the right invariant vector field with this vector here, then it turns out it has a second order zero at this point if this vector is in the kernel of the differential of the Gauss map. So if it's not a local diffeomorphism, you have this direction, there's a related killing field, which at P is VP, and it has a second order zero here. So from the point of view of a sphere, that means the, the related Jacobi function 
has a cross on it, you know, sorry, plus, plus locally, I'm sorry, plus, minus, minus, or maybe you have more crosses, but you have some picture like this, and then you get nodal domains. If you have a cross like that and you have an analog set on the sphere, you have at least three components on the sphere. Okay, this component's weakly stable. This is, oh, if you want, weakly unstable. This one's weakly unstable. If I enlarge it a little bit, then these regions are strictly unstable. But I'm index one, I can't have two strictly unstable domains, disjoint domains. So, um, so that's the basic idea of the argument. So you have to check that you have this sort of cross picture at the point. So you have to think a little bit geometric, but it's, it's not too bad. Okay, the next crucial step is getting curvature estimates. And there's, there's two really different approaches. Uh, it depends on what you like to do, what you're familiar with. If you're familiar with things like I do, I like rescaling arguments. I'm very happy about stuff like that. You can rescale and eventually produce an index one, a stable or... A, it can't be stable. An index one minimal surface uh, in R3, which is a planar domain, and you could say some properties about it, but uh, you can analyze those. those are the only ones you have are Enoper and, uh, and the cat right? So you can kind of go through and try to analyze something about rescaling. But once you actually know the Gauss maps of diffeomorphism, you can, in terms of the Lie constants that come from the Lie algebra, the metric Lie algebra of the Lie group, you can actually give explicit estimates for the uh, norm of the second fundamental form in terms of those invariants and in terms of the mean curvature. So you explicit estimates. So you don't just say, yeah, it's bounded. If I get it, um, once I bound the mean curvature from above, I get curvature estimates. But in fact, I can explicitly tell you what they are if you tell me what the Lie group is and the metric Lie group, associated metric Lie algebra. So the, okay, all right. So that's kind of a nicer way to do it, but then we need to know this. Otherwise, you could do this without knowing that. All right. Okay, so here's the really hard step. This is the step that's difficult to generalize when we go away from SU2. It's not impossible to generalize, but it's sort of a, a difficult point. Uh, you could go through it. There are lots and lots of steps still coming up, but this is the one that's sort of hard. And I guess you'll see, it's at least reasonable. Right? I think I have time to go through all these different steps. So, um, so I pick an upper bound for mean curvature. That's this H1 that you see up there. So that's an upper bound for mean curvatures I want to consider. And I want to look at all index um, one. Remember, M of X is M of X or index one sphere. So I'm looking at all index one spheres whose mean curvature is less than or equal to this upper bound. Okay. Okay, I know I have curvature estimates. Remember, that's what we just talked about. We have curvature estimates. So if I have area estimates, then I get compactness result. Right? For example, you have diameter estimates. If I have area estimates, if I have, for example, I have diameter estimates. I have nice local control about what's going on, and subsequences converge. So this is the crucial step to get. If you're traveling along this uh, index one surfaces, well, Maybe as I travel along, the area becomes infinite, right? It sort of disappears. But as long as the area is bounded, I have an open one manifold, but the endpoint's also there. I can keep going. This, is, this allows you to keep going when you want to move that one parameter fan. Start with index one sphere. I want to just move it all the way down to H of X. In this case, H of X is zero, and I want to obtain a sphere there. So this is really crucial. Okay. So... Standard kind of argument by contradiction, suppose it fails, that means you have a sequence of uniformly bounded constant mean curvature spheres of index one, but their areas are going to infinity. So here's a great place to start thinking geometrically. What do we know about the Gauss map of all these spheres? So I'll try to draw a picture. So the sphere is getting big area. Big area also means big diameter, intrinsic diameter. So here's this big sphere. Here's the S2. Here's the Gauss map. Here's, here, here I have my Gauss map. So the area of the Gauss map here is 4 pi, right? That's the image. It's a diffeomorphism. So if the area is really, really big, there have to be big disks centered at some points, intrinsic disks, such that the area... 
So the radius here is big. Think of it as a sequence of spheres. So this is huge. I can find a big disk so that if you fix like a number like 1 over n, the area of its Gauss map, which is a diffeomorphism, it's a little thing over here, the area of this disk is very, very small. Okay, so I can find a big disk with small area. If I normalize by translations the, of the sphere so that these points are at the identity, since I have curvature estimates, I can prove in the end I get an immersed, so it's a, so it's passing through the identity element. Uh, there's, I should pull down my slide. <coughs> okay, so some subsequence of compact domains on the surface converges to a complete, stable limit surface, which is an H prime surface of the mean curvature is less than or equal. Some, some mean curvature in, that lies below H prime is the limit of these mean curvatures. It's a subsequence. Um, and the surface has completely degenerate Gauss map. Why? Because the area of its Gauss map is going to zero. So it's going to have to have a sort of like a one-dimensional Gauss map. So you, here's my limit surface, sigma infinity. So it's defined somehow in terms of mappings. You've got a mapping. It's a planar domain, and so it maps into the space. Uh, and it has a completely degenerate Gauss map. Oh, how do I get stable? Uh, stable is done by this very nice, easy-to-use process called the dynamics theorem. Uh, if, you, if you have such a surface like this, uh, I can take limits of it, right? Now, this, this surface, you can see, could be at most index 1. So there's at most one unstable domain on it. But if I start taking base points going to infinity, if I choose these points correctly, then this unstable part disappears. So I can always make, make the limit surface be, be better. It can, I can always, always choose this limit so this limit's stable. It could be index 1, but I, by taking new limits, I make it be stable. Right. Completely degenerate Gauss map. Not hard to prove in this case that there's a, killing, a right invariant killing field that's tangent everywhere to the surface. Something like in the like kind of what we did over here. There's a there's a right something in the kernel. You get a, a killing field that's completely tangent to the surface, and this is a right invariant killing field. So it comes from a one parameter group of SU two. One parameter groups of SU two are top are just circles. Those are the one parameter subgroups of of S. They're not like R's. They don't have any R's. You only have circles. So, in fact, we, so we see that actually the surface is foliated by circles, right? Each, I get the orbit of each point, right? I get a circle. Okay, so I kind of see something that looks like a cylinder. Okay, now the actual surface might be a covering space of the cylinder, but just pretend like it's a cylinder. It's a cylinder in the space. It's a union of circles. Uh, of these uh, integral curves of this one, these one parameter groups. Okay, uh, we have bounded curvature. Uh, again, by arguing with what's called the dynamics theorem, you can prove that this surface is quasi-periodic. Well, if you have a quasi-periodic cylinder, that per periodic in terms of like isometries, it always has linear area growth. And if it has linear area growth, it, it is parabolic. So that's what we're going to use next. So this cylinder I get uh, has small area, relatively small area growth, and in particular, it's what's called a parabolic Riemann surface, the underlying conformal structure. All right. So now, now I want to try to understand. So we have this killing field, which is tangent, uh, but there, there's no more. Uh, you can't have any other killing, right invariant killing fields, which are, are tangent to the surface. Uh, otherwise, you like make a two-sphere with as an image. You can't make a two-sphere this way, uh, or it have to be a subgroup. There are no two-dimensional subgroups in in SU two. There are various ways to argue here, but uh, you can pick a another vector, say here. So here we have this uh, vector tangent the identity element. We take a different direction. That's not tangent everywhere to this cylinder. So it produces a Jacobi function which changes sign, 
But all right invariant vector fields on SU2 are bounded. So it produces a bounded Jacobi function. So I have a stable surface, which is parabolic. I cannot have a bounded Jacobi function on it. Right? I have a positive one because it's stable, but I can't have one that's bounded and changes sign. The, you can use cutoff functions, or you can just apply a general result about parabolic manifolds. And you have something stable with respect to this operator, then uh, that means you have a positive solution. You can't have a, any other bounded solutions, a multiple of that positive solution if you're parabolic. So, anyways, fairly simple. Or you can just use a standard cutoff function argument. Okay, so we get this Jacobi function which changes sign on the surface, which is a contradiction since we're parabolic and stable. Okay, so that's the way you get these area estimates. It's rather uh, lengthy uh, to go through all these things, but anyway, you get, you get it. Okay, so now we're going to get to the easier understanding steps. I think I still have three minutes. I can go through these. Okay, so now, now that we have area estimates, we can understand what m of x is. So take a component of m of x. Okay, so here, here are the numbers. Uh, zero to infinity, right? If you have an element in M of X, then I see I have a little interval here that's parameterized by its related constant mean curvature values. So this is a here's sort of M of X. But in general, of course, I might have, right now I don't know uniqueness. I'm going to get to uniqueness in a second. But I might have another index one sphere with the same value. So what I'm saying is that each of these intervals parameterizes the entire space now. Okay. So that's the picture you get from area estimates and curvature estimates. Now, it's also not too hard to prove uh, directly. Really big mean curvature is sort of a unique sphere, which would mean there's only one component, but we're not going to prove it that way. So, right, but I'm just going to say each component, if I start, so I'm index one here, the limit of index 1 is, why is the index, limit of index 1 sphere is going to be index 1? Well, what happens, look at the eigenvalues. You have lambda 1 is negative, right? You have lambda 2 and you have multiplicity 3, right? And then you have your next eigenvalue. So the only way you can lose index 1 is this one becomes, joins up with this one, but that means the multiplicity is 4. Right? You have an index 1, which you don't have. It's always have nullity 3. So that, this is one of the places we're using that first thing we said, we have nullity 3 for index 1. So this doesn't happen, so we continue being good. We continue keeping this other eigenvalue away from this one. So in other words, this is... A, all right. If we can't come here, we can't ever go the, you know, bring these into here. So this always says multiplicity 3. So... We're getting in a good shape. We, we have area estimates. We have a limit. We have one manifold. We just keep on going until you get all the way down to zero. There's no obstruction. Conversely, you can go this way. As long as you put an upper bound for the mean curvature, we have curvature estimates and, and area estimates. Okay. Now, here's, here's a, sort of the crucial thing, which is we're getting uniqueness. We want to generalize what, what Hopf did. Hopf somehow define some quad quadratic differential and say the vanishing of this quadrant quadratic differential means something. Right? Like you're totally umbilic or some property about, the, about the, the surface. So you need to somehow also define a quadratic differential on an arbit if you're given a given index one sphere, so remember the sigma is index one, suppose you have another one with that same value of mean curvature then we want to construct on it a non-zero complex-valued quadratic differential with isolated uh, negative index zeros. Suppose that you could do that while you're in a sphere, so that means that form must vanish identically. Um, so I should say something here. At the present moment, we're kind of trying to figure out the best way to do this. We actually have two different quadratic differentials which vanish on M. And one of them, you can see that you have uniqueness up to left translation, the other one not. But presumably, both of them are equally good. So this is uh, somewhat involved calculations. 
uh, for either one of those differentials. One's more geometrically defined, the other one's not, so, so I don't know the best way to do this. But there certainly exists a non-zero complex differential which determines somehow sigma. Okay, and on the other hand, it must, you can't have such a non-zero form because it has negative index zero. So, so it must vanish identically, but vanishing is identically means you don't have this property. It must have been a left translation of sigma. So it's kind of a standard kind of argument. So now I just want to sum up what we've seen. So we now know that there's only one component in the space, and it goes all the way from, it, its values cover all the way from here to here. If you have any other sphere, a point here, not necessarily in M of X, then we apply that previous result, it's a left translation of this particular one. And that's, so we're getting our uniqueness result. All right, and um, this also we've talked about before. Why are all the spheres Alexander embedded? Well, for big mean curvature, they're just little round spheres, almost little round spheres. They bound balls. And then these balls, these three manifold balls start moving around. Maybe they start crossing themselves. But they always cross themselves in sort of a good way. They don't cross themselves like this. Through the, mean, through the, the inside. They always cross it, sh themselves through the outside, so they stay Alexander embedded. Always moving a certain kind of way. And uh, this is also pretty easy, because for big mean curvature, we have uh, just the little round spheres. And those are small area. And after that, we have area estimates. So we certainly get that. And the whole manifold is sort of, nat is sort of a natural center of mass for these spheres. Yeah, and uh, everything varies analytically. So it's actually kind of an analytic function. So let me just say real briefly, uh, since I'm running out of time, the claim is we can redo all, in other league groups, like where you're different, different morphic to R3, you can basically do everything I've talked about Except, like I say, the hard step is generalizing step four because step four is not true. There is no, once you bound the mean curvature from above, you do not bound the area, just like in R3. Look at all spheres of constant mean curvature less than or equal to one. There's no area bound. They become really huge and bigger and bigger, right? So you don't get this property you have in SU2. So you have to make a slightly different variation. You have to go away from the value of H of X by some small amount, then you get area estimate. So you have to somehow make a little bit, be a little more careful. And then uh, you have to analyze the remaining cases. So the remaining case, the, the cases uh, are uh, topologic R3, you're in PSL2R, or you're in a semi-direct product. And then the semi-direct product also breaks into different cases. And it, it sounds like you're doing case by case, but you're really trying to understand the geometry of these spaces. So while you prove the Hopf conjecture, you're also proving a very interesting, or this, this Hopf uniqueness property or classification space. You're also understanding these spaces that before you didn't really know as well as you thought you knew them. You really start feeling what they look like and understanding how they behave. So there's a lot of insight you gain in the actual spaces you're in. And uh, anyway, I've gone over time for a couple of minutes, so I probably should stop. <laughs>